Hello and welcome to this review of the Happy Hacking Keyboard Professional 2. I get a lot of requests for video reviews and smack dab at number one has always been this one. However, they're very expensive starting at £150 which I can't afford by an order of magnitude and the chances of finding one at a recycling centre are practically nil so I haven't had the chance yet. This one's on loan to me from Tom, aka Hizzer, who shipped it along with a converter he very kindly made for me, and which hopefully you'll be able to see in a video very soon. Now this keyboard, and especially its switches, are quite probably the most polarizing in the community, with its fans promoting it with a fanaticism nothing short of religious zealotry, and its opponents derisively calling it the most expensive rubber domes on the planet. So whatever I say, I'm going to piss off at least half the community. But just remember, I'm simply reviewing this from my own perspective. As they say, your mileage may vary. Now, because this one's from November of 2011, it's a modern keyboard instead of the vintage ones I usually review. So I had to get used to it a bit at first. There are three ports at the back, so I thought I had to get a USB mail to USB mail cable to get it to work, but that doesn't do tiddly twat. Turns out it's this port that you need to use. The other two are USB ports that you can plug stuff into at work. A very handy feature. But bizarrely, although it can handle my phone just fine, it says it doesn't have enough power to handle my simple, partially dissolved USB stick for some reason. It has a large bank of dip switches behind this cover here, almost as many as on the Omni key. But unlike the Omni key, the makers were nice enough to put this sticker on the back that shows you exactly what each switch does, instead of having to look it up in a manual. Seems like this can be used on a PC or on a Mac. In fact, I think his uh, used it on a Mac because it's got a few Mac-like buttons on it. And the other four buttons are for customizing the layout, which I've set in such a way that it looks most like a normal keyboard layout. It's built small and light, a bit heavier than you would expect of such a tiny keyboard really, but this really doesn't feel like luggage or anything. It feels fairly well built, though maybe not up to the standards of the ancient keyboards I usually review. I mean, it's not exactly, but it doesn't feel like they skimped on build quality either. It's a 60% layout, so there's no F keys, no nav cluster, and no numpad. Now, as I mentioned in my recent Cherry video, that's absolutely horrible for me, but I still used it for a full week to test it and to see if I get used to it a bit. And I have. It's more intuitive to me now than it was at the start, although playing games on it is still a nightmare, and I can't do work very quickly without the numpad, but that's just my perspective. The layout is based on layers, so a lot of the functions require the use of the FN key here, and then it does what it says at the front of the keycap. The layered keys are okay, even though there's so much written everywhere that it's a bit confusing at times. They included calculator keys in the layer, albeit in a rather baffling layout, and unlike with the Cherry I reviewed last week, they didn't bother to include a numpad in it. Although the numpad layer on the Cherry was crap anyway, so it doesn't matter all that much. <laughs> The layout is only available in US ANSI, which is most unfortunate. The backspace, called delete here, isn't on the correct row, and it's confusing to have so many buttons on the first row. So whenever I need minus and plus, I tend to press these two instead. Not nice for a chemist like me, where you need to use both extensively. At the very least, they could have colored these two buttons gray or something to indicate the end of the numeric block. If I had to pick my own 60% layout, I would have gone for an ISO style enter, stick the tilde key here, stick the pipe here, and then put the backspace key here where it belongs. And you get the added benefit of having a two unit backspace as well. It's also quite wasteful of space at the bottom, not something you would expect of such a small layout. Although the logo here is pretty cool, a control button here and then the caps lock here would have been quite nice. And they could have included a dip switch to swap control and alt, like on the Omni key for if you prefer that setup instead. And maybe they could have added a lock light here because it's not otherwise present on the keyboard. 
The arrow keys are layered in a diamond nav over here, which is okay, surprisingly. Normally I'd go for a T nav, but because you need to be pressing the function key at the same time, you really only have two fingers to use side by side. So I don't mind it like this for day-to-day -day operations, although this setup is hell on earth in games. The keycaps are thin PBT, and these aren't actually native to this board, although they are official HHKB caps. This keyboard normally comes with black keycaps with black legends, which sounds absolutely bizarre to me, and I've looked at them, they really might as well be blanks. These caps are from the white model, which comes with actually legible caps, so I'm glad Tom went with this setup because it looks really good like this, I think. The lettering is die sublimed and quite sharp, with a good font. They look nice and high quality. As I'm sure everybody knows, it uses Topra switches. Which you can get at several weights and even layouts where the weighting changes depending on the position on the board. But this one is a uniform 45 grams. Topra switches are a capacitive dome with slider design, and this leads people who don't like Topra to often refer to it as the most expensive rubber domes on the planet, which, in all fairness, is probably true. Dome with slider switches are a type of more sophisticated rubber domes, and with this design they more or less take it to the extreme. Technically, it's a dome with slider over capacitive PCB design, and it uses very light coil spring under the dome as the variable capacitive element. Being capacitive, it has several inherent advantages over a normal rubber dome board, including native N-key rollover, check out my F122 video if you want to know how this works, and more importantly, it actuates before it bottoms out. They used high quality rubber for these switches to provide a very smooth tactility as you can see in this official force curve, and the rubber dampens the sound quite a lot of course. They're maybe a little bit louder than most keyboards you'll find in an office nowadays, but they're still very quiet and the sound is very thick and full, they have an unmistakable thock sound to them here, I'll give you a quick demo. As for the key feel, I really like it actually, I can see why people want to use these. It's very smooth indeed, and they don't bind at all on off-center key presses, even on the larger ones like that. It goes down perfectly well. The tactility is quite noticeable, but not distractingly so, plus the sound is really nice. They could have made a spacebar a little bit heavier though, I found that I often accidentally press the spacebar by the weight of my finger. And for some reason, the tactility on this is not all that noticeable. It feels linear, actually, so you don't actually notice that you're doing it. So often when I look away and then look back to the monitor, I notice that I suddenly accidentally typed a huge line of spaces. <laughs> Now, in many of my videos, people ask me how do these switches compare to Topra when talking about actual mechanical switches like Cherry, Alps, and even Buckling Springs. But this being a rubber dome keyboard, it doesn't feel anything like them at all. It's like trying to compare steak to tomatoes. I've only really found two switches that really resemble it. One of them is this, Tactile Green Alps. Now we only have this loose switch here, so until I get a whole full keyboard with these in, I can only make a vague estimation, but these seem to feel quite a bit like Topra, except the tactile point is right at the top. But still, I would say they feel, they feel quite comparable, actually. Yeah, really not far off at all. So until I verify this with a whole board, I'm going to tentatively suggest Alps SKCM Neon Green. A much more valid comparison though wouldn't be with mechanical switches, but with another rubber dome board. So I pulled out this, my best rubber dome keyboard. It's a Packard Bell branded BTC 5130, quite a common keyboard I find on a regular basis. This is what it looks like under the skin. Like Topra, it's a dome with slider keyboard. And in this case specifically, it's a conductive dome with Cherry MX compatible slider over a PCB. So again, like Topra, it has a PCB, but this one's not capacitive. I've spoken out in defense of BTC dome with slider before, and I maintain these are really good. If your pride doesn't forbid you from using rubber domes, I heartily recommend these because they're excellent. 
They're very snappy, very smooth, and these too don't bind on off-center key presses. Compared to Topra, they're more tactile and the tactility is a bit sharper, and the sound is louder. And not quite as pleasant, but it's still quite good. Yeah, not that bad, really. Now here's my big problem. These BTC dome with slidey keyboards are really common and you can get them for dirt cheap. The Topra switches are a little nicer, yes, but they cost a fucking fortune. These BTCs are, in my opinion, and I've given this a lot of thought, at least 85% as good as Topra, in my opinion. And for a cost two orders of magnitude greater than this, I really, really struggle to justify the cost, to be honest. So, all in all, there's my verdict right there. It's a nice board. If I had a full size, I definitely wouldn't mind using this at all because it feels and sounds really nice. But for what it is, I really think it's too expensive. I know it's relatively expensive to make capacitive designs, but really I'm sure at least half your money goes into this, this little logo right here. So if you don't mind buying products at a vastly inflated price and don't mind rubber domes, I can definitely recommend this keyboard. But otherwise, either way, there are plenty of alternatives. That's it for this review. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. And here is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.